I think it's really important to get your hands on the knife to to feel every edge and make sure that things are fitting up the way that they're supposed to and to give the final finishing touches. But there's a ton of value for me, at least, in having the machines do all of the things that are really repetitive. And that's that's where a lot of stuff can go right and save you time. And it's also where a lot of stuff can go wrong and cost you a lot of time. So, you know, I, as I said, I want to cast in stone all of my best days. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 98 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. The Knife Junkie Podcast is the place for knife newbies like myself and knife junkies like you to learn all about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anyone who loves knives. And Bob, an interesting interview today with a Canadian knife maker. Yes, we're talking to Aaron Goff. Uh, He's someone who got on my radar from uh, Alex Tissot. He told me all about him. Alex is a um, folder collector, but uh, veered into fixed blades to get one of these Aaron Goff Mark II knives, these amazing outdoor knives. Aaron takes a lot of time and uh, is very meticulous in the creation of these things. And that was what really interested me in him. And uh, we had a very interesting conversation. He's a, he's a, a, an enterprising designer. Well, let's get into that interview and hear from Aaron right now. You know you're a knife junkie if you love your knives more than your spouse. I'm here with Aaron Goff, uh, a Toronto knife maker who a friend of the show, Alex Tissot, hit me to. He is making some incredible uh, outdoor fixed blade knives, and his process is uh, quite interesting to sort of uh, watch unfold on social media. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bob. It's appreciated. It's my pleasure. So uh, right before we started rolling, we were talking about the model, the single model of fixed blade knife that you're making right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me about that uh, that knife. Well, you were asking me which one Alex had, and I said that it was very easy to tell you which one because I only make one. Right. Um, and yeah, that that uh, makes life a bit simpler. Um, yeah, so the, the knife that he bought is called the Resolute, and the current version of that is the Mark III. Um, so as I said, like I only really do one version at a time, which is, you know, the, the best it can be. Right. And it's just designed as a a general purpose outdoors knife and is, you know, I'm trying to make the best version of that, that knife that I can. But it also strikes me as a general purpose, general purpose knife, not just an outdoors knife, because there's a subtle touch at the, at the butt of the knife. It seems everything seems to come to a pyramidal point uh, that looks great for breaking glass, say, for instance. That is exactly what it's for. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I have a lot of um, military customers and like law enforcement, fire uh, personnel that buy my knives. And I I think of it a little bit as like a a survival knife, but I didn't want to be gimmicky about it you know i've i've had some survival knives where like the window breaker on the back is is so sharp that you can't hold the knife in like a reverse hammer grip you know um so i didn't want to do that i but all you really need is just a tiny contact point and that'll let you break a window so yeah i try to try to fit as much utility into the knife as i can without being gimmicky without you know taking away from other aspects of its use uh, it's an elegant way to integrate it into the full tank too. I I just Thanks, I like the way that. Oh yeah, absolutely. So so I I mentioned uh, earlier you seem to have a love of technology. Yeah. That it, so uh, when I look at the Resolute, it is such an amazingly refined and cleaned up design. Like Thank it's you. it's it is so. Uh, you're welcome. It is it is so without without fat. Mm-hmm. And then when I observe uh, your process, at least how it's curated on Instagram, your process seems to reflect those clean lines. Everything seems so incredibly orderly in your shop. I thought you were going to say it was the opposite. I thought you were going to say all the fat is in the process. Negative. I mean, I, I look at him like this is a very orderly individual. You know, sometimes you see someone shop and it looks like, uh, you know, something uh, like the knives are born out of chaos. But right. you look at your shop and it looks like you're building robots or something. You know, it's like 
Tell me a little bit about your process and, and your evolution as a knife maker. Um, it's actually interesting. So the, the guy that I, when I was a kid, I, for a while did, uh, you know, quotation fingers apprenticeship with a, an Australian knife maker named Neil Charity, who made some really amazing, uh, they were mainly lockback folders with like beautiful inlays and all this kind of stuff. And his shop was exactly like what you were saying, like knives appearing out of chaos. It was like every single tool in his shop had like a sand dune of dust that led up to it. And the only places where you could even like almost see the floor were like his pathways around the shop. It was, it was crazy. Um, yeah. So like my process is, I don't know, I guess it's an external representation of, of me, of what I would like my brain to be like. I don't think my brain's really like that, but, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it drives me crazy if something isn't right. If something isn't like clean and, functioning correctly um it drives me crazy so much that sometimes it's actually an impediment to getting work done Hmm. like if i have a process that isn't working correctly it'll bug me so much that i'll need to like stop and fix that process despite the fact that i just like have to get shit done now you know Mm -hmm. so a lot of my day-to-day is kind of finding balance you know trying to find time to work on process trying to find time to get stuff done. And I think I'm getting better at striking that, that compromise. Well, you, you mentioned uh, process a number of times there. Mm. You make sort of machine made knives that are hand handmade as well. They're like hand finished machine. Tell me about your process. It sounds like there are a lot of different ways of, of uh, right. getting to the end. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I describe my process as I want to be able to, kind of cast in stone every one of my best days, if that makes sense. Because when I'm, when I've, so I've made knives fully by hand in the past. And when you have a bad day, the the knife that you make isn't as good as what you are capable of. But with my process, because, so I'm combining um, CNC machinery. So like computer controlled milling machines and cutting machines and stuff, along with um, hand assembly, hand finishing, um, you know, like, I think it's really important to get your hands on the knife to to feel every edge and make sure that things are fitting up the way that they're supposed to and to give the final finishing touches. But there's a ton of value for me, at least, in having the machines do all of the things that are really repetitive. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's where a lot of stuff can go right and save you time. And it's also where a lot of stuff can go wrong and cost you a lot of time. So... You know, I, as I said, I want to cast in stone all of my best days. Mm. So every time I have a, an idea to improve the process, I get to go and sit down and change the programming for the CNC mill so that it does that better idea every single time. You know, so I'm currently at version 451 of the program that machines my knife blades. Wow. Yeah. And, and that's the third version of that program like the third time that i started from scratch with new fixtures and new um everything so i okay this is a part of the process i don't quite understand um so you're you're saying this is the 400 and some odd iteration of programming the machine to make the knife yeah yeah so um basically i have a, a cnc machine which i'm not sure if you're familiar with those but basically it's a a computer controlled machine that can move a cutting tool in three dimensions um, and it, it, you know, I don't just give it, uh, an image of the knife and then it cuts it out that unfortunately it doesn't work like that. We, I, you actually have to go through and program every move. Like there is software to help you, but you know, as, as I get better at what I'm doing and as I learn more, I find little improvements. So you have to go through and program those in and hopefully each time I get a, a slightly better knife. So is that like a new line of code? Like, oh, I, I need to move the swedge a touch, and uh, and I think I know how to do that quicker. So you just go in and you and you go into the swedge line of code, so to speak, and you just tweak that, kind or do you have to rewrite the whole darn thing? No, no, I do just tweak a bit. Yeah, so uh-huh. I use um, a CAD product called uh, Fusion Three Hundred and Sixty. Okay, um, and so it lets you do it in more of a visual way rather than having to manually tweak it, but. I kind of wish that every part of my process could be like that. Like I sometimes feel like I'm the weak link, you know, Mm. as I said, when I have a bad day. Um, So, yeah. 
Well, with with this, the the advantage of this, it reminds me of you know I uh, I trained in visual arts, drawing and painting, mm -hmm. and I could never do comic books. You know, I always wanted to draw comic books, and I could because I could never. Uh, across a bunch of pages make a recognizable character over and over i could make the clothes right. and everything but the face was always different right. and i could see how if you um uh if you sort of hone in on a design that is a representation of all your best design days in one knife and you get it in a piece of steel to try and get that again totally freehand might be a maddening thing and if you can if you yes. can get that same thing every time and then focus on making making the sweetest thing you got with fit and finish and materials and stuff. That's where the, that's where the, uh, you know, satisfaction lies. Yeah. Well said, man. Absolutely. And yeah, like I try to, you know, there's some parts that the machine just can't do as well. Like that, the hand finishing of the bevels. I try to do all of that just to, it gives you a last opportunity to make sure that everything's right. You know, um, I think the hands on time with the knife is still really important. So, uh, were you always designing with the aid of a computer? Or are you draftsman also? How does uh, how does your design um, uh, process work? So, I actually can't design in a computer. Funnily enough, like not for a knife. For everything else, I make it in the computer. But for a knife, I find that if I do a design on the computer, it's it's dead. It doesn't flow well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like my mum was actually a uh, a draftswoman for a mining company. And so I, I learned old school paper and pen drafting growing up. But in, in my process of making a knife, I usually don't even go to that extreme. It's usually, you know, a pencil and a big bit of paper and mm -hmm. freehand strokes to start off with. And then, you know, French curves and a, a nice pen to, to go over. So usually that'll be my first step. I'll draw it down on paper. I'll get something that I think looks pretty good. And then I'll actually go straight to making it. And I generally tend to finesse the design quite a bit once I'm making the first version by hand. Okay. So that is actually an important thing. I, I personally wouldn't go from a paper design to a CAD drawing to a machine blade. I have always um, had the best success doing the first versions by hand. Um, just because when it's, when it's in your hand and you're holding it as you're shaping it for the first mm -hmm. time. You can, you know, hold on to it for a second and then tweak a bit on the grinder and, and see how it fits your hand. And then after you've got something you really like, it, it's actually really challenging to reproduce that in CAD. I bet. I mean, I bet it's hard to uh, reproduce the experience of, oh, I just took a little bit off the end uh, and now it feels great in my hand, but how do I draw this exactly? How do I get exactly yeah. this? Yeah, and one of the really important things for me was so I don't know if you've um, followed like the, my my journey through knife making, but I started out off com completely with hand tools, just like literally a file and a hacksaw and a, wow, you know. Um, and one of the things that I promised myself when I started doing CNC stuff was that I would never ever make a change to the design just to make it easier to make. Hmm. So how would that you mean in terms of uh, just like it would make the whole thing easier in terms of programming or what do you mean? Yeah. So if I did um, like a, a saber grind, for instance, rather than a full flat grind, mm. that would make my life so much easier right. uh, because I have more, I have more material to hang on to at the back of the knife. And that's actually one of the reasons why um, most um, production knives tend to be saber grinds is because that way they can put them in a machine that's called a burger grinder and they can just rip through the blades, grind them in, you know, 30 seconds flat. And it doesn't matter if the angle of the bevel is a little bit off or something because then the grind line just appears higher or lower. Whereas with my knives doing a full flat, if, if the bevel angle is off or if the stock thickness is off or something by just a thousandth of an inch, it'll produce a step at the top of the plunge line where you're transitioning from the bevel to the coil and the whole thing's trash. Like, mm. you know, there's no point trying to hand finish that out. It's just wrong. God, that, I bet that's happened a couple of times, huh? Sure has. That's got to be a maddening. Mo so, so you get all of your bevels ground in on the on the CNC also. Yeah, that's correct. So I have it. I have it programmed now so that it it actually makes a tiny little flat island on the coil in uh -huh. between the start of the handle scale and the plunge line. So that way, I can always get that flat area perfectly meshed up with the top of the plunge line. 
so that the bevel is always like the, the little sweep at the top of the plunge line is always perfect. Yeah. Wow. So that's just tons of that's 460 some odd trial and error uh, to, to kind yeah. of come up with that. So how big are your batches? How do you decide mm. uh, about production? And, um, you know, how, how do you how do you kind of economize? You, you have this machine that helps you. Uh, you still have to buy materials and everything. How do you figure out how big to make a batch, that kind of thing? Well, ideally, my batch size would be one. Because if something goes wrong when you're working in a batch, um, more often than not, you won't realize until you're a significant way through the batch. And I have had that happen to me in the past where I was working on 100 blades and I accidentally scrapped 70 of them. Oh. Yeah. And that was a really shit day. I can tell you that much. <laughs> um, so yeah, ideally the, the batch size is one because then you get to inspect every blade as it comes out. So on the machine, when I'm, when I'm machining blades, I am, I have several blades in process, but, um, only one step is happening at a time and I inspect them in between every single step and then they, they come off the machine. Um, but yeah, you're right. There are some things that are just simply not economical to do in, a batch size of one and heat heat treatment is one of those things for instance do you, do you heat treat everything in your shop or do you send them out i i used to i used to heat uh heat treat everything in shop but um then i found a heat treating place that's kind of local to me and i mm -hmm. tried them out and i just realized that their results were way better than what i can achieve with my little oven well you know what if you're if you're actually uh if you're going for perfection with your yeah. blades uh, you may as well have make it a collaborative process and have the the people who are best at heat treating take care of that. You don't have to sweat it. It was actually an interesting process because when I first went to them and said like this is what I want to do, they actually said like we can't do that. It can't be done. So my my steel is A two tool steel, which is mm -hmm. in a lot of people's minds it's a fairly simple steel. I actually had one guy the other day saying like, "A why are you using A two? That's insane." But <laughs> The performance that I get out of it, I'm, I'm really, really happy with it. It's a really good combination of toughness and edge retention. And the toughness lets me go really thin in the bevel. Mm. Like my blades are only 16 thousandths of an inch behind the bevel before they're, before they're sharpened. Right. Um, and that aids the, the um, cutting performance a lot. Obviously. So, yeah, but when I took the, you know, my, my blades and my specs to these guys for the first time, they were like, you can't get that hardness with that tempo and they were right in with their equipment we we couldn't get that result to begin with and what actually ha ended up happening was that now they have to run all of my blades completely separately from anybody else's stuff because <laughs> if if they so they have these big vacuum furnaces that you could like park a small car in right wow. but normally they'll load them up with you know hundreds or thousands of pounds worth of material and with that much steel in there they actually can't so one really cool thing about these furnaces is that they quench inside the furnace. Mm. So they, they, um, they pull a vacuum and then they have the big heating elements in there that actually heat the steel through um, like infrared radiation rather than convective heating like in a normal oven. And then when, they, when it's time to quench them, they actually in inject um, cooled nitrogen into the chamber at high pressure and they rotate it through a heat exchanger to cool the material in the oven down. Wow. Yeah. So the blades come out of heat treat with like no scale, no oxides, no nothing. Like they're, they're perfectly clean. There's no way for oxygen to get to them. But the problem was that if, if they ran my blades in a heavily loaded furnace, they couldn't quench them fast enough to get the hardness that I require. So now every time I send them a batch, regardless of batch size, they run this entire giant furnace. Oh my gosh. With just my little stack of knives in the middle which is a little bit crazy. But. Well, it, it superpowers them, I think. Yeah, yeah, it kind of does. <laughs> um, and yeah, they're they're great. Like, you know, I have, a, I have a good relationship with the owner of that company. And, you know, anytime something doesn't come out just right, he personally takes over and, and makes it right. And that's exactly the kind of, that's the only kind of person I'll deal with outside of my shop, really. Well, and especially because you're a small businessman and you're you're running a small business, it's good to have that sort of, person-to-person -person contact, especially with someone yeah. who's doing something as important as, as uh, yeah. treating your high-performance knives. So you mentioned how thinly ground they are, and they're full yeah. flat ground. So what are the kind of 
purposes these are put to? What are, what are the uses for them? And do you test them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I am far meaner to my knives than <laughs> anybody else should ever be. Um, I have broken many, many knives to get to this point. I actually have a drawer that's just full of broken blades. At some point, I'm going to turn it into a, an artwork, like a wall hanging that's just called right. the, the price of progress. You know? <laughs> um, my customers are typically outdoors people. Um, so they're using them for butchering and skinning game. They're using them for, um, you know, splitting firewood into kindling to start fires, striking ferro rods to start a fire, prepping food at the campsite, you know, lots, lots and lots of different uses. Um, I also have a number of military customers. So I've had knives that have done like multiple tours of Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, the, you know, the window breaker has been used to, to pop open windows to rescue people and that kind of stuff. There's a lot of different uses and that actually poses a really big challenge because, you know, making a blade that has the right sweep at the tip so that someone can, you know, cape, cape an mm-hmm. animal or a skin an animal with it without piercing the hide. Right. Um, but then it's also good for all the other tasks that you want to use it for, you know, that it's, it's tough enough that you can split firewood with it, but that it has enough cutting performance that it's good for everything else. It's, it's a difficult challenge. And if, if it's being used for hunting, but also being carried by military, you know, it's got to be just stabby enough, but not too stabby to, <laughs> to to hit organs when you're skinning an animal, that kind of thing. Not that I yeah. know what I'm talking about. Do you, are you a huntsman or a, a hunter or anything like that, outdoorsman? I wish I could claim to be more of a hunter than I am. No, I'm, I'm planning on getting my firearms license here at some point soon. I really like um, long distance marksmanship. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that that will really translate into hunting. Right, right. Um, we'll see. Sniping, you can snipe some deer. Well, I actually had a really awesome experience. Uh, one of those experiences you only get when you're dealing with you know these incredible people. So there's a special operations group here in Canada called JTF2, mm-hmm. and they're um, basically hostage rescue is is their mandate. So you know if if a Canadian embassy was taken hostage, you know or taken over in some other country, they would be the guys that would go and repelling in the windows and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So these are really hardcore dudes. And, um, uh, one of these guys came for a shop tour and I got chatting with him and said that I wanted, I'd always really wanted to try really long distance shooting. And he said, Oh, actually a buddy of mine in JTF is, um, uh, the, the leader of the like long distance marksmanship training program. And so I ended up making them a couple of knives and they took uh, my girlfriend and I and uh, the guy that works for me, Mike, we all went to their private range and oh. we fired like 250 rounds each. Oh the course my of the day. God, that's yeah. so cool. And, it was amazing. And you got tips from, from the best. And these guys are, are absolutely amazing. Like um, the, the main guy, so we're shooting at targets out to 750 meters away. And the main guy was like, he could tell which way the wind was blowing and how fast it was blowing just by looking through the spotting scope and seeing the shimmer in the air. That's insane, man. Yeah, it's it was it was really cool, man. That's, that, that, that's next. Yeah. Uh, that's a uh, the next evolution right there. You know, <laughs> dude, it's so cool. So yeah, like you don't get. I I don't think I would have had that opportunity if I wasn't you know making knives for these guys. So what's what what kind of designs are you thinking of next? I mean, I saw that you. Mm. Uh, you have a folder design that I saw, actually a really nice uh, drawn, you know, hand drawn picture. It was sort of a tanto, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, but but what other designs? Let's just say fixed blades for right now, because it seems like uh, uh, folders are a, a whole nother uh, bag of worms. Uh, but uh, if you were to if you were to make another fixed blade, maybe for uh, some of these military guys, what what are you thinking of? So the answer is actually a little interesting because the answer is that I won't. Um, basically the, the idea with the resolute is that, so I, eventually I want to be making exactly three knives. Um, and if we were to give them knives, they would be outdoors, kitchen and city. So the outdoors knife is the resolute. The kitchen knife is, um, an eight inch Santoku that I'm already kind of working on. That's the one that you've been using and abusing in your own kitchen. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's a beautiful looking knife, man. Thanks, man. I love the look of that handle. It's got a nice Thank you. faceted thing. You know what? And funnily enough, that's one of those things where I have the original drawings and it looks nothing like that. Ah. It looks it looks super boring on paper now when I look back at it. 
when you were standing at the grinder, it started speaking to you, like like yeah. authors often say their characters speak to them. Yeah, exactly. Which I, I don't know. I find that a really weird thing to relate to because I think of myself as like a a logical person that should be able to put stuff down on on paper and you know, but it it just didn't happen. And then I've been working on various kind of boring kitchen knife designs for a while and then i was just like you know what i'm gonna just make this one and it it changed as i was making it quite a lot and i like it a lot more now it evolved in your hand that's cool so yeah so city i'm assuming now is the folder exactly okay. yeah so what do you what do you what is the purpose of that knife is it uh is it a little bit of urban survival a little bit of cutting your sandwich at lunch yeah see that's the interesting thing is like the resolute's very kind of a hardcore knife, but I don't think that people that are using their knives in the city, you know, myself being one of them, I don't think that we're, you know, prying open ammo crates and, <laughs> and, and surviving the zombie apocalypse. I think we're opening packages and, you know, so I think that one's going to be more like a gentleman's folder as opposed to, you know, a hard use knife. So I think that'll be interesting that like, I'll have kind of a range of different philosophies in the different knives because they are meant for very different uses. I don't want to just have, you know, one, I don't want to do a folding resolute, if that makes sense. Got you. I got you. All right. So I, I so you say the most um, refined incarnation of your idea of Aaron Goff custom knives is to have three different knives, yeah. the kitchen, the outdoor, and the, and, and each one of those would be kind of refined over and over like you did the Resolute until yeah. it was perfect. And then, and then that's it. Yep, pretty much. That's, that's cool. So are you, do you design other stuff? Are you a maker of other things? Definitely. And, yeah. and knives, are a, uh, knives are a stopover, not a stopover, but knives are just a, a slice of your interest? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one, the, one of the things that really interests me is actually the process uh, for making the knives. Like, so my background outside of knife making is that um, I'm going to say quotation fingers. I'm a software engineer, quotation fingers, um, because I don't actually have any education past high school, which I barely managed to pass. But I've been writing software for a long time, and I've done that professionally for a long time as well. So that background really influences how I think about the process, you know, and I want things to be very repeatable and as perfect as I can make them. Right. And wanting that makes me want to build machinery to make the process better, you know, and hopefully there'll be a lot more of that coming soon. So you're kind of an inventor. You have an inventing streak. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't call myself that more of a... Well, well, I mean, but but you're you're talking about building machines to build other things to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's like a yeah. that's a meta creator. <laughs> right. So yeah. so I saw you have um maybe maybe uh one of the thorns in your side in the process mm. of sheath making. Uh it might mm -hmm. seem um I I've made a few kydex sheaths for my knives uh or you know cuz I tinker around but also for um, knives that I buy that I, you know, right. sheaths I want to switch out. And, and for me, it's, it's, uh, it's like stabbing blindly in the dark. Sometimes they come out awesome and other times they're, you know, they come close to ruining the knives. Right. But I saw you were 3d printing a sheath. How much, mm. which is a, seems like a brilliant idea. Uh, how much is 3d printing playing into your prototyping for say the kitchen knife, but definitely for the folder. Funnily enough, like not at all, not oh. even a tiny bit. Yeah. That surprises me. I think 3d printing is awesome and I've been really interested in it for a really long time, but I've only owned a 3d printer for about six months. It's additive and yeah. And milling is reductive. It's like uh, yep. two different kinds of sculpture in a way. Yeah. And they both have their strengths for sure. Like, uh, so one of the machines that I'm looking at building uh, to help me make knives is actually a robotic sandblasting cabinet to Ooh. help with my finishes for the, the DLC. And um, I've been prototyping parts of that and 3D printing them. And, you know, I thought, oh, there's no way these are going to be like durable enough to hold up for real use. They're just, you know, prototype parts. But I threw a couple in the sandblasting cabinet and just left them there and they're fine. 
I'm going to be able to make like finished parts of this machine on the 3D printer, which is amazing. Wow. That yeah. is amazing. So, so you will have the one and only of those, <laughs> uh, of that, uh, process. Well, actually, um, so that's one of the things that I want to do this year is, uh, so coming from the software world, um, we have this thing called open source, which means that, you know, if I write a, a little utility, a bit of code that helps me achieve some task, I can open source that and other people can use it and it can help them. They can improve it. I can get the, the, uh, benefit of their improvements mm -hmm. and that exposure to that from a fairly young age. Um, has really shaped the way that I think about business and industry. I tend to give away all of my process. Like if anyone ever emails me saying like, Hey, um, can you give me the like feeds and speeds and what tooling you're using to do your bevel? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll send them the screenshot, them everything. Like that's fine. I understand exactly how much work it takes to replicate that stuff. Right. Right. So one of the things I'm planning on doing is uh, this thing called the open hardware initiative. And, uh, sorry, Open Machinery Initiative. You can tell it's new because it's <laughs> not even remembering myself. But so stuff like the automated sandblasting cabinet, I want to open source that design so that other people can build it if they want, other knife makers, other product makers, whatever. So basically you would make the uh, code available uh, or, or the whatever. Now, now this is showing my age and lack of tech, but you, you would give uh -huh. the the technological recipe for people to make that, whatever yeah. it is, code. And they could just put that into their maker, put the right kind of uh, their 3D printer, put the right kind of material in there and get it. Yeah, it'd be a little bit more involved than that because there's going to be like a sheet metal enclosure that you'd have to have laser cut and then weld together. And okay. there'd be some, some you know, like an Arduino uh, that's programmed to control the motion and some electronics. And yeah, but, you know, all of that stuff would be open. But the point is, yeah, you're offering them the blueprint to, to put this thing together. Yeah, and I want to do way more of that. You know, like I want to bring my heat treat back in house, for instance. But mm -hmm. um, buying, I actually went to a company and a couple of companies and said, like, how much is it for a small vacuum furnace? And the answer was like five hundred grand. Wow. Yeah. So I could either like go and buy one on eBay that's like thirty years old for ten grand and hope that it works, and it probably won't. Or I can look at building one myself. You know, so that that's the route that I'm going to take is is design one, build it myself, open source it, and then hopefully other people will help me make it better. I mean that if if you can do it, which obviously you can, I say that's the way to go because it seems like a very expensive um, uh, venture. Knife making, all of the tools, oh, okay. espe especially if if you are um, if if part of your main uh, goal is to reproduce the same design over and over high fidelity um, uh, yeah. reproductions of the original. Uh, all of that machinery costs so much money. Um, how, you were talking about uh, you've been in a number of different businesses across a number of different uh, industries. Uh, mm -hmm. The knife business, um, what are some of the challenges? Is it a, is it a, seems like a difficult venture. Yeah. And I mean, I think the most difficult thing is just getting things right the first time, you know, like if, if you have to make 30 knives and 10% of them need, you know, twice as much work because they're not quite right, that will kill your business really, really fast. And I have firsthand experience with that, unfortunately, um, because so I, I am a full-time knife maker right now mm -hmm. and I've been a full-time knife maker for the last year. But before that, for the previous two years, I was almost a full-time knife maker and also a full-time software developer because oh, wow. I was literally working my day job to pay to keep the business afloat, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I liken that situation to, uh, you know, in Pirates of the Caribbean where Johnny Depp kind of rides the ship yeah. and it's sinking <laughs> and then he, and then he steps off onto the dock. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was what I, what I was uh, trying to do at that point, make sure that it, I didn't go down with the ship. Yeah. So I, I think that like just, if, if, um, if you're reworking too much stuff, if you're, you're rejecting too many blades and that, that's kind of a, a cat and mouse problem because if your standards are really, really high, you're going to reject stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you're going to, you're going to have things that don't meet your standard. But if the amount of stuff that you reject is, is too high because you've got a process problem, then yeah, it's going to drive you out of business. And that was basically what happened. Um, I, 
you know, I had people that wanted my knives, but I was having so many problems with the process. I couldn't make them uh, fast enough. And my fixed costs, you know, rent and insurance and all that stuff just, just killed me. I was going backwards. So do you have uh, someone that you – that well, you said that you have a, a young man that works with you. Uh, mm-hmm. Is it is it hard to find – first of all, I, is, is he the only guy who works for you? Is it a – Yeah, Mike – so interestingly, um, there are a lot of changes happening at the moment. I'm actually going back to being solo. Okay. Um, and that's – so Mike has been fantastic. He's a, actually a fantastic knife maker in his own regard. And that was one of the reasons why um, he and I started working together is because I'd seen his work. And the the problem was for me in that situation, just that, you know, so if, if you're going to bed on a Sunday night and then you suddenly realize like, oh shit, I forgot to do that thing that Mike needs for tomorrow morning. Um, and if I don't do that thing, then he's not going to have any work to do tomorrow. And I'm just going to have to, you know, pay him to sit mm-hmm. around that all of a sudden that kind of thinking just invaded my entire life. Uh, it every single waking moment became about the business, which is, you know, I'm kind of going to gravitate there anyway, because I'm really passionate about what I do, but it becomes a stress. It, it really kills your creativity when you're um, constantly stressed out about the business. So I found that bringing someone else on to help me rather than being a productive thing, it became uh, a stressor. It became a counterproductive thing. Well, was it uh, difficult to find someone who could adhere to your sense of order and process? Um, yes and no. Like Mike actually adapted to that pretty quickly. It was more, more that, um, my, I think at times I'm a bit of a difficult boss. I'm, I'm trying to be nice about it, but my, my standards are so high that, um, you know, I'll see stuff that other people won't. And that makes things really difficult. You're trying to communicate like, no, when you move the knife like this, I can see this tiny inconsistency in the bevel. Yeah. So you have to train someone else to have your eyes and, and that's super hard. Yeah. Because it's not their name. That's literally etched in the side of the blade. You know, it's, it's not even like it says spider co it says Aaron Goff. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Very, you know, yeah, I'm I'm never selling the business unless it's to like a family member or they have to change their name or something. <laughs> All right. Change it to Aaron Goff. Yeah, right. exactly. So well this this brings up a question. I've I've been um you know, I think a lot about the OEMs in China and how they've mm-hmm. kind of changed things. And I've I've been wondering lately about whether um OEMs here in the United States will catch on. Uh, I, sp- I spoke with a small company called Dauntless. Uh, manufacturing that makes some really cool knives and they're mm-hmm. all outfit they're 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 headed up you know there's millet um and yep. uh so is this something you would ever consider uh doing it seems like you're set up in the in the right way um i think the answer is no unfortunately um just every time i deal with an outside vendor i find myself um having at least a little bit of a battle you know, so my, my deals, the guys that do my DLC, for instance, um, I just had two batches in a row with 70% rejects. Whoa. Yeah. Um, and you what, know, uh, what is, I'm sorry to, I want to stop you right there. What does that yeah. look like and, and, and how do you fix it? Um, well, again, because, you know, I can't ship a, a knife to a customer that has, you know, like a, a different sheen across the blade or, you know, a shiny patch here or, mm. uh, you know. And to them, they're just like, well, what are you, what are you talking about? It's black, you know, like it's black and it's protecting the blade. What's the, yeah. And I'm like, but like, look at this thing here, you know? Yeah. So there was, there's been lots of little issues. One, one of the issues that we had recently was that, um, apparently they're, they have a process before the coating called plasma cleaning, which basically they, they ignite a plasma inside the vacuum chamber and they actually use that to etch off an outside layer of the the steel in order to pry it up perfectly clean surface for the coating to go onto. And apparently that process isn't computerized. So the guy like put it in the chamber and then he was working a second shift on the side. And so he went home and left the blades in there for like three hours or something. And it actually changed it. it, So the, the knife is sandblasted to a matte finish and it actually changed the texture along the edges of the blade. So it looked like holographic. It was kind of cool. But it's not what I'm selling my customers, right? right? Like, 
Yeah. So, you know, I had to, I have to explain to them. They're like, what are you talking about? We don't see anything wrong. It's, you know, it's black. Yeah. What do you want? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, like all of those blades had to be sandblasted again really carefully and then recoded. You know? So, so the model, the model is for you to, to kind of like, uh, uh, you know, an, an old school painter in his atelier, you're like, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna work on your work and, uh, Mm-hmm. Yeah, having someone else come to you with their design to say you have you have the process. Here's my design. Mm. Uh, just wouldn't work for you. I don't think so. All right. Well, I I, I won't send yeah. that email to you then. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things. I'm always I, I'm always really tempted. Like, um, I think I am actually going to be doing an outside job shortly, but it's not knives at oh. all. I, what um, is it? So I have some friends, uh, Tim and Nick, who are awesome. You should look them up if you like guitars at all. Oh, okay. Um, and I, I actually started in a shared workshop in a dank, moldy basement with, with these guys. Um, and they were working on their guitar stuff and I was working on my knife stuff. And we became pretty good friends over a, a lot of boxes of really cheap wine. <laughs> um, and uh, they have gone on to become just absolutely amazing guitar makers. What's, uh, um, what's the name of their guitars? It's uh, Frank Brothers Guitar Company. Frank Brothers. And so, I've been a guitarist for a really long time. I used to work... Uh, for the Gibson distributor in Australia. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, they're... So, I've, I've held a lot of really, really expensive, really nice guitars, and they are way, way up there. And they're having problems with um, getting one part of their guitar, which is custom-made for them, which is their, the bridge. Oh. Sorry, not the bridge, the tail tailpiece. So, they have a floating tailpiece. So, I'm actually looking at making those for them because they know that they can hand it over to me and I'm going to be like as anal as they are about every tiny little detail. And because I'm a guitarist and I've worked on setting up guitars and stuff, I I know what's important in the design. Right. Oh my gosh. That sounds like such a cool project. Yeah. I, I, that, that Stuff like that excites me. That's going to be super fun. See, I, I think uh, creatively, it's always good to have a couple of things going. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, at, in periods where, where I've been painting or drawing, I've always had a ton of paintings and drawings going at once. Mm-hmm. So I can move from one to the other when, when times are getting tough with one. But, so yep. like making these guitar bridges or tailpieces, it's a yeah. way to sort of uh, maybe focus on your knives even more or in a different, you know, in a different way. Sometimes you have to get out of your head to get a fresh look at things. You know, um, yeah. there's definitely been a couple of times where someone will say something to me and I'm like, that's so obvious. Why haven't I been doing that? <laughs> well, what about what about knife shows and marketing and social media? What how do you mm. how do you let people know about your work? Um, yeah, that's one. It's really difficult because I think that marketing, as a general thing, is insincere. How so? Well, like there are a thousand companies out there that want to sell you their sneakers, you know, and they're not telling you that their sneakers are better. Really, what they're telling you is like. You put them on and then attractive women are going to throw themselves at you. You know, like that seems to be, it, it's all aspirational marketing for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of getting the word out about what I do, I try to do um, what I call process documentaries instead. So my, my YouTube videos that yeah. you, it sounds like you've seen yeah. just showing like literally just showing exactly how much care and thought I put into the knives and I think at that point, it communicates the value very well, as opposed to just being like, you know, look at this cool knife, buy it. Yes, yes. I mean, that reminds me of Snacks. I don't know how to pronounce it, yeah. but you know what I'm talking yeah. about. You watch his process and, and, and you understand uh, why at the end of it all, he can only make 10 of them and they cost a million bucks, you know? Yeah, yeah. they should because of all of that work. Yeah, he's... He's more nuts than I am. I, I love him, man. He's, <laughs> he's awesome. He and I talk on Instagram fairly regularly. He's, he's a very cool dude. Yeah, yeah, and, and makes yeah. some very cool and, and uh, unique kind of knives. Uh, yeah, it yeah. seems like, it seems like uh, social media these days, especially like Instagram because it's all pictures and, and uh, guys of the preponderance of, of knife collectors are, are, are men and men are visual. Mm-hmm. And you go to Instagram, you can see and then buy. And that's how I, well, I learned about you uh, through, uh, through Alex, but, uh, you know, but now I just keep up with you because of it, oh, because thanks, I man. see you on. Yeah. 
So uh, what's next for you? What's next for you? Uh, is it is it the kitchen knife? Is it the folder? What can we what can we see from Aaron Goff Custom Knives uh, in the next five years? Um, next five years, eh? <laughs> um, I'm sorry. That sounds like I'm your high school. Uh, uh, no, the, yeah, yeah, high school uh, yearbook or whatever. Yeah. Um, honestly, right now my my head is all in the next five days, the next five weeks. I'm in the middle of um, moving to a new workshop. Oh my. The, doing the downsize and uh yeah that's kind of eating up 130 percent of my time at the oh moment. geez yeah um but longer out like i have a couple of processes that i'm processes again <laughs> um a couple of processes that i'm working on that have the potential to revolutionize the way that i make knives and give me a lot more freedom and one of the things that I want to get out of that freedom is the ability to experiment with design more easily so that I can chase something like a folder because mm. making a folder is going to require a lot of design iterations to get it right. Right. And right now with my current process, you know, each time I make a new set of fixtures, it takes me like three weeks. So if I have to do that every time I want to make a tiny tweak to the folder to make oh. it better then that's going to get in the way of me making the best knife that I can. And I, that's a real problem for me, right? So, yeah, I'm working on basically a new generation of my process that will open the doors for me a bit. Um, and one of the things I actually want to do is, so I said before that I'm not going to make any other different knives. What I'm going to do is cheat a little bit. So I'm not going to make any other knives as regular models. But what I want to do is do limited editions where mm -hmm. I just make like, 20 of a knife design just because I think it's like super fun or cool or whatever. It's not meant to be like a super practical knife and just get to have fun with it, you know? So I think that's going to be really cool. I'm looking forward to that. I have a, I have a pair of matched daggers that I want to do oh, as a limited God. edition. Yeah. That, that, um, that's totally up my alley right there. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Matched daggers. Yeah. And I want to call them Siler and Trubdis. So <laughs> you're, you're, you're choosing between the, yes. the two sides of the, the river sticks. You know, oh, my sure. daughters so. would love that. <laughs> right. So yeah, like stuff like that. And I want to kind of pay homage to some of the knives that, uh, inspired me when I was younger, you know, like some, some classic ones. So like the, the Randall, uh, knives from World War II and, oh, yeah. uh, Fairburn Sykes fighting knife, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah, just lots. There's lots of really cool knives out there. It'd be really fun to do a modern kind of take on. And and in the process of doing those small batches, you would also create a a small and robust uh, market for for your collectibles, and that would be uh, uh, you know add a cool mystique to the to the rest of your endeavors. Yeah, I guess so. It's it's funny, man. Like I never really. Um, like I know a lot of collectors have my knives, but it's it's really not um, the market that I think about a lot, which is maybe to my detriment. I, I don't I don't know. I just I kind of in my mind it's like if a knife isn't getting used, it's it's um, an ornament. Then stop making them so damn pretty, sir. Yeah, <laughs> you, sorry, you look at sorry, them, it's like you. I would if I had one, and I'm <laughs> I'm quite sure Alex uh, is not taking his out and beating on it. I would. I would I would leave it just to appreciate and to you know. He told me he was taking his to a survival course. That, really? that was yeah. Oh, so cool. I that's awesome. I don't, I don't know. Awesome. Maybe I'm maybe I'm getting him in hot water here. Hey, no, no, I'm I'm sure he is because he he carries all of his knives and and right. he's got some doozies. So right. Uh, so anyway, uh, where should people look for you, Aaron Goff? Where should people look for you? Find your work. Um, I, on Instagram or, um, I, I prefer Instagram over Facebook. Yeah. So I'm Aaron, Aaron uh, on Instagram and, um, goffcustom.com. If you want my store, you can just go there and buy as many knives as you want. That's totally cool with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can imagine. Well, Aaron Goff, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure meeting you and talking about your spectacular knives. The resolution. Thanks for having me, Bob. All right. It's a lot of fun, man. My pleasure. My pleasure. Take care. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. Back on episode number 98 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Bob, good interview with Aaron. Uh, thoughts, takeaways? Well, he really um, stresses process. I mean, he really is always refining his process. And to me, that's uh, that that's what makes him a very interesting 
knife maker to observe, like on Instagram. Uh, like I mentioned in the uh, in the podcast, he reminds me of Snexy. It just sort of uh, shows every step of him dialing in and perfecting each part of the process. And uh, you know, when you perfect the process, the product is is going to come out, you know, great. And you and you see these knives, and it's true, they're just clean efficient looking designs and and the beauty is really in their uh, execution and it's not like he's got you know 500 different designs that he's got to try to work with his process is really really defined since he has a limited number yeah actually that is a very very interesting uh part of his identity as a knife maker he's interested in perfecting three different designs and uh and staying with that. And I think that that's really cool because so many different knife makers and knife companies are always striving to get out a new model, a new model. This is sort of kind of in the Chris Reeve knives line of thinking. Uh, keep working on something, get it right, make it better, get it righter, <laughs> yeah. more, more right as they say. And uh, yeah, just turn out a, a perfect, a near perfect product if you can. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, that is going to wrap it up for episode number 98 of the Knife Junkie podcast. Remind you to join us this Wednesday for our midweek supplemental episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. And then join Bob on Thursday on YouTube for a live video show, Thursday Night Knives. So a lot of knife talk that you can uh, get caught up with Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco. So for Mr. DeMarco, I'm Jim Person saying thank you for joining us on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at ReviewThePodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, TheKnifeJunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at TheKnifeJunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on the knifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at the knifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 seven listener line at 724-466-4487. And you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast. Knife junkie.